Sean Michael with Release Faith. I'd like to talk to you today a little bit about fundraising, especially about the four main areas that can help to sustain mission and ministry to the larger world in your community. Today's topics that I'd like to talk about include appeals, gifts in kind, working with major donors, and events. Each of these is a unique way that in fundraising, we want to reach our larger community, connect with people and their generosity, and find ways to support the work that we want to do. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about each of these areas, and I would love to help spark some interesting conversations in your community about how you can find the resources you need. I've been doing some sort of professional fundraising for the past 25 years. And whether I was raising money for a nonprofit organization that served the larger community, for a special project in a congregation that was designed to serve um, people in our neighborhood, um, new missions, new projects, um, service benefits, or the types of projects that partner between faith communities and um, other nonprofit partners in that neighborhood. And in all of these cases, there were certain key things that we wanted to take into account. So I'd like to talk about some of those things today. In addition, this is my chance to let you know that if you're going to, as a faith community, have a benefit or a fundraiser, I want you to think very seriously about who is this for. It's really not fair or just or right to hold fundraisers that benefit only the congregation or its members where we're inviting the broader community to participate. At the end of the day, personal stewardship, discipleship, and belonging are how the basic needs of the church budget and the maintenance of the congregational facilities need to happen. That's just the way it is. At the same time, when those facilities are being used for uses that are far beyond just what the members of the congregation expect. Uh, maybe there's a homeless shelter, a soup kitchen, a school, another program inside that building. That changes the calculus because now we're talking about ministry that extends far beyond the walls and the life of the congregation out into the world. So when I'm talking about fundraising or benefits today, I want to talk about those uh, activities and events that raise money that then go beyond the life of the members of the church. If anything, these are the resources we need to practice our discipleship out in the world. Let's think a little bit about appeals. Did you know that one of the easiest ways to get money from people that you need to do good in the world is to simply ask for it? In essence, that's what almost any crowd fundraising effort is. That is what uh, when people put up emergency cash lifts on social media and say, here's a Venmo code, here's a cash app code, a PayPal code, uh, here's a way you can give digitally in another fashion. That's an appeal. It's simply stating the need, stating what would help to meet the need, and then encouraging everybody to participate. And especially important in the act of appeals, and I've learned this from a dear uh, friend and fundraiser, uh, Francisco Herrera, you don't give people an out. Because if people are going to take an out, they will. I don't have any money right now. Uh, I'm too busy. I don't really understand this project. Uh, I don't know why I would give to that. That's not a priority. People who need a way out already have one in their head and in their heart. However, if you give them an additional way out with language like, give if you can, please help if you can, um, you're inviting people to begin that process of justifying why they can't. On the other hand, if you simply say, here's the need, please give. It's a wonderful way to invite people to give. The other thing that's great about appeals is that depending on the particular method you use, whether it's a social media campaign, um, direct mail, um, appeals that come through newsletters, websites, um, electronic newsletters, they're fairly low cost. Appeals usually cost you the cost of the printing and the postage or uh, whatever the tool is that you're using online to, to disseminate that far and wide. 
Um, sometimes if you're going to use a crowdfunding site, which honestly I would not recommend um, unless you are crowdfunding for something that is not tax deductible, right? I understand that there's lots of people who do personal appeals through crowdfunding um, to try to raise dollars. But fees and taxes on all of that make that a pretty expensive way to raise money. On the other hand, if you have a qualified 501c3, which basically all congregations in the United States, you may want to check your local laws, are, or a nonprofit entity, right, that you're fundraising for, then it's fairly easy to simply say to someone, please give, they can send you the money, and 100% of those dollars end up paying for the need in the community. When you're doing appeals, you want to tailor your message to the recipients. Is this an appeal that's going to go to business partners in the community? How do you honestly and fruitfully describe your relationship with them? Maybe it's going to go to other faith communities, other congregations uh, over a wide area. Again, what's the nature of the relationship that you're looking to describe for them? And then lastly, it may be going to individuals. Maybe they don't know who you are or what the project is that you're trying to promote. This is an opportunity to give people some information about who you are, what you're doing, and why it matters. And again, don't give people an out. If they're going to take an out, they will. But if they're inclined to be generous and then your messaging gives them permission to not be generous, that's on you. So make sure that when you state your needs, state that it's important and tell them, please give. Why are gifts and kind important? They're an opportunity for someone to give a good or a service when they may not be able to give cash at that moment. Um, this can be true for your business partners in the community. And sometimes the value of what they give could be greater than the amount of cash that they could give. For example, if there's a local caterer who has the ability to provide all of the food that you need, right? for an event or a special get-together with major donors, and they're going to give that as a gift in kind. In other words, they'll donate the stuff and receive the tax benefit of having donated those things. You may receive a larger value in goods than you would have if they had simply cut you a check out of available cash on hand. Um, this can be especially true for um, business partners that have low margins. In other words, every month they're looking to make just enough to stay above water. At the same time, there are a couple of cautions with gifts in kind. Finished goods that are manufactured are usually much easier for organizations to write off and give away. Uh, for example, if your favorite sports team has a baseball and that baseball has been autographed by one of their team members, that kind of memorabilia is fairly easy for that team to write off as a gift in kind. And you never know, that may be a very popular registration incentive, prize for an auction, prize for a raffle, uh, or any other creative way that you might use that item to help um, support that event. On the other hand, if you are in touch with people who are makers, right, people who are making things by hand, artists, um, be very cautious about inviting those folks to give gifts in kind. Um, in large part because for the artists, they may donate a painting, for example, that sells for $1,000 at a silent auction, and that's wonderful. A buyer gets a lovely new painting, the artist gets to support something they love and care about, and the organization gets the thousand dollars to help support ministry in the community. On the other hand, when it comes to the artist's actual charitable giving, they are only able to claim the value of the material inputs in the piece of art. How much was the frame, the canvas, the paint, or whatever other collection of materials that might go in it? So please be aware that you may derive a tremendous benefit from handmade goods or from works of art. Just be cautious about the relationship that you have with that artist, knowing that uh, what you will receive is far greater than what they can claim they have given. And if it's important for that person to be able to claim that donation on their taxes, 
that may not be very much for them. Lastly, don't forget about services. Gifts in kind aren't just things. Gifts in kind include people who have a special skill that is portable. For example, professional organizers, people who do genealogy work, uh, people who do any kind of um, cleaning services or home maintenance or auto maintenance. There's so many amazing gifts and skills in our community. People know how to do incredible things that are a real benefit to their neighbor. Don't be afraid to invite people who know how to do a thing to donate an hour of their service, a couple hours of their time, or uh, a gift certificate that is equal in value to a visit to their store. Uh, so for example, an auto mechanic uh, might have a hard time quantifying how long it would take to do a particular project, uh, but they might donate a gift certificate for an oil change or a certain kind of service, tire rotation, for example. That's a wonderful way for them to donate their time and their effort for someone to receive something that is of actual benefit and for you to be able to receive the donor's gift that helps to support your ministry in the community. Let's be honest for a moment. We want everyone to grow in generosity and giving and sharing. There is a deep and central aspect to our pursuit of justice in God's world and our pursuit of uh, caring for one another that requires all of us to be able to evaluate very carefully how much do I actually need, what is necessary and sufficient for my survival, and also how much can I give to others to make sure that everyone can thrive. At the same time, while we certainly always want to celebrate uh, someone who, for example, has often given $20, suddenly giving $40, that they have had tremendous growth in generosity. When we talk about major donors, we're talking about people who typically might give, and it's going to be different by organization, $500 a year, $1,000 a year, $2,000 a year. Context really matters for this. So I don't want to have you peg this down to a specific dollar amount. But people who are already capable of giving a significant sum oftentimes have resources far beyond what they are giving. And it's important as we cultivate relationships, deepen our understanding of what people have uh, in order to do their stewardship and their discipleship, that we create opportunities for serious and meaningful conversations about people's ability to give especially their ability to give significant gifts. Now, one space where this takes place is in conversations around planned giving. Planned giving can be the setting up of a trust while someone's alive. I would like to entrust this money to a particular cause and give it to that benefit. Uh, it can be when people set up a bequest. When I die, I would like to leave this money for this cause. But it can also be a way that people make one-time significant large gifts to help make the startup of a new ministry or project possible, the expansion of a new ministry or project possible, or a whole new experiment, right? There may be a position, uh, a staff member that we're envisioning, oh, if only we had this person to help with this task. A major donor can be someone who would be willing to come to the table and if you've had an important enough important conversations with them be willing to underwrite that project for a year for two um, while you build the capacity around supporting that position long term so these are really important conversations that allow for great big steps opening your doors adding a door adding the people who come in those doors to do the work in the ministry. These are not to be overlooked. And it doesn't mean that we want to have policy, best practice, um, who we serve in the community dictated by major donors. Part of what makes someone a major donor is their understanding that when they give, they relinquish 
that money. They no longer have organizational control. They don't have the ability to boss around uh, the, the beneficiary. They give precisely because they want to support in a wholesome way. And so that's an important part of major donor education, to understand that if someone were to give 10, 20, 30, 50, $100,000, they are giving it away. Not just the money, but the control and the ability to direct how that project goes. Which is not to say that there's no accountability. It's really important as part of our major donor relationships that we help people understand the impact of what they did, what changed because of their gift, how many people were helped or served because of their gift. In all of those circumstances, those are really important conversations. But we don't want to ever confuse tremendous generosity with outsized control over the life of a ministry or project. Let's talk a little bit about events. Events can be a really fun and exciting way to raise dollars. At the same time, events come with a number of pitfalls. Events are not free to operate. And if you're anticipating that the only source of revenue for an event is going to be what the individual participants put in, whether that's through uh, an admission ticket, the price of a dinner, um, participation in special activities like um, silent or live auctions, raffles, all of these sorts of ways that we um, bring in revenue at an event like that, inevitably you'll find that the amount of money that you bring in will be tied to the complexity of the event, which means it's tied to the cost of the event, which means that if you're relying solely on those primary givers, most of what those people will be paying for, or at least up to half of it, may end up paying for the event and their own benefits, as opposed to the money you wanted to raise to create resources for the broader community. So it's really important when you're thinking about an event to think about ways that you can receive portions of the necessary resource for that event at little to no cost. This might look like inviting hosting spaces, food providers, gift providers, items for silent auctions, items for live auctions to be donated. When you have enough gifts in kind coming in, then that takes some of the expense of the event away. Uh, these items, if they're given freely and then somebody else buys them or somebody else spends money on them, then that helps to create a higher return. Secondly, this is a wonderful opportunity to touch base with either key givers in your community, key givers in your congregation, or um, business community members. Maybe there's a member of your congregation that has an important community business. Business sponsorships make a huge difference in terms of the success of an event. So when you're thinking about an event, if you've got a sponsor who can come in to help defray the costs of the event, whether that's hosting space, um, uh, we used to do a very successful and popular uh, bowling party. And we're really lucky because all of the items that went into our silent auction were either paid for by a sponsor or they were given freely as donations. In addition, um, we would host a 50-50 raffle. The only expense there is the cost of the tickets, and people love being able to walk away with prizes. Lastly, all the prizes that went out for, whether it was really excellent participation, high fundraising, um, uh, being very generous, being a very generous adult, a generous youth, all of those prizes were covered by sponsors. Uh, and so, the base cost for the event was low. The actual entry cost we also tried to keep low to make sure that it was available for broad participation. When you're thinking about an event, you really have to ask yourself, is this event primarily for community building? In other words, is the goal to get as many people together as possible to have a good time? Is the event primarily about education? 
Are you going to spend time and effort on recruiting a keynote speaker, uh, educational presentations? Um, is the money raised secondary to making sure people understand your issue or your event? And lastly, uh, is this an event that is meant for a broad audience or are you really trying to build and deepen relationships with very major donors? Um, because that's a topic we'll talk about in a little bit. It turns out that when it comes to philanthropy, a significant portion of the money to do good things comes from people who are able to give large gifts when there's the right relationship and the right understanding of their personal stewardship. So in an event, in a nutshell, we want to keep in mind always the base cost of the event, how many gifts in kind can we get to defray that cost, how many sponsorships can we get to defray that cost, and if it's meant for a broad audience because it's community building or educational in nature, how do we make sure that there are low barriers to entry that still account for fundraising and opportunities for people to be extremely generous and to have that generosity celebrated? All of those elements go together in terms of making a really wonderful event. Well, I hope this conversation has been a great entry point for you into thinking more carefully about the way we do benefit fundraising in our community. And as a last thought, I'd like to leave you with this idea that when you begin to prepare for your next appeal, request for gifts in kind, engagement with major donors, or the planning of an event, know together as a planning team, what is the change we want to see in the world? What's our vision for a reshaped neighborhood, community, place to live? And let that energy guide your hearts to guide your heads. Because at the end of the day, if the goal is just to raise the money to fill the budget, to raise the money to pay for the project, there will begin to be a transactional nature to every conversation that you have. But if you can have in mind a particular vision for the kind of community and world you want to live in, then that means that every conversation around your fundraising and benefits will be a conversation about vision and mission and transformation and about how all of us, all of us together, have been invited in deep faith to give ourselves for the life of the world. And that, friends, that will be a conversation that is blessed many times over.